Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Joanne Kennan. I'm the executive editor for Healthcare at Politico. And I want to thank Milken for convening this session and for having me. Um, you'll be able to uh, submit questions. Um, and uh, we will spend about the last 15 minutes of this panel hearing from you and incorporating as many of those questions as I can. Um, when Milken asked me to moderate, and I, I have moderated for Milken before, when they asked me for this particular panel, and I'm stepping out of my moderator hat for one minute, did not know, they know I cover this, they know my reporters write about it, they know I've spoken about it, but they did not know how acutely important this topic was to me that very week. My college roommate, friend of mine for many, many, many years, a wonderful woman, had been suffering from a severe mental illness since, early, since our early 20s. And she had died two or three days before Milken contacted me. And not from COVID and yet it was from COVID. As the epidemic worsened and the isolation and the fear you know, she was in uh, Long Island, I'm in Washington. We were on the phone a lot, <laughs> texting. She was in a manic phase, but she had other things besides that going on. And I watched the, her fears get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I watched her world get smaller and smaller and smaller. She got afraid of everything, eventually including the water in her own apartment. And her world got so small that there was no room for her in it anymore. So this is an, um, not all of us have that particular story, but all of us have a story. And if we don't have a story, maybe it's because we're not listening hard enough. When we had our prep session, and I'll, I'll introduce my guest in a minute, because that is my job. But when we had our prep session and we talked about this, we talked about having three kinds of mental illness crises during this pandemic. One was the pre-existing illness, the pre-existing behavioral challenges. People who were already sick, whether they were in treatment or not, they had a problem and clearly a pandemic, an economic crisis, isolation, quarantine, illness, fear, all these things make it worse. And racial justice and all the emotions and fears and anger and everything else spilling out makes that worse. So you have the pre-existing. You have the people who right now we're okay before, and this is too much, and they've developed mental illness, and they've developed a need, and they've developed something diagnosable, something frightening, something severe. And then there's some of us who cope really great during a crisis. We are just fine. You ask us how you are, and we say, got it covered. But when this ends, or when we've had it to deal with it for a few more months, some of those people will fall apart. I don't mean fall apart in a derogatory way. It'll hit, right? So we talk about mental illness. It is um, probably going to be with us in a more visible, tangible way for a good deal of time to come. So I'm gonna be quiet now, which is really my job and let them talk, but first I'm going to introduce them. Um, and we're gonna to try to be as lively and interactive as we can be on Zoom. Forgive us for any flubs, You've all, you, you're all familiar with it. We'll do the best we can. Um, and also I've told them to correct me if I get their names wrong, but we're gonna start with Latisse Briggs, who I've got right this time, I think. Um, she's the Senior Director of Milken Institute Center for Strategic Philanthropy. We've got Arjun Desai, who I'm going to call JJ, who's the Chief Strategy and, in it, with his permission, Chief Strategy and Innovation Officer at Insight Tech. Kabir Nath, the President and CEO of Asuka North America Pharmaceutical Business. He told me that's not how they say it in Japan, but he gave me a pass. And Richard Pops, who is the easy name here, the Chairman and CEO of Alchemies Inc. Um, I guess what I want to get everybody in the conversation with a quick question, which is we're all talking about mental illness. This is pretty much a yes or no question. But just get, get us all started. We're all talking about mental illness being a salient part of this pandemic that we are enduring. Are we, do we have our arms around it? As much as we're talking about it and recognizing, do we really understand how deep, pervasive, and profound it is? And that was a biased question, but go ahead, Kabir, answer it. No, we don't. I mean, first, let me say, I'm very sorry to hear about your roommate, but clearly that's not the only one of these tragic stories we're gonna hear. So no, I think we are talking about it, but do we have our hands around the depth of it or the length of it or what we need to do differently? No. Okay, 
Matisse. Absolutely not. We, we are not even close. Um, and I think it's for reasons of, you know, we, we were in a state of crisis before and we, we didn't have a handle on that, but we had, we understood that better. Um, we, we are sensing what's happening now with the impacts of COVID, but the ripple effects, um, we won't know all the ripple effects until it's all said and done. And so it's important for us to be adaptive. So no, absolutely not. We don't have our hands around it. AJ? Yeah, thanks, Joanne, and thanks for personalizing this as, as an introductory comment. Um, you know, in, in the true fashion of a sports analogy, this is first inning kind of stuff, and neurologic disorders are and continue to be a challenging spectrum of understanding, and I think mental health is either a part of most neurologic disorders or a diagnostic uh, indication of, of its own. And so, you know, we're very early on, and I think our eyes are more open now to better understand it. Richard. Well, I'll agree violently, but also add, and, and your own experience proves the point, Joan, it's not just the patients themselves, it's the impact of everybody around them. It's the, it's the family, it's the community, it's the employer, it's, it's it, the devastating impact of untreated or poorly treated mental illness is, is, is incredible. Right. The, the um, easy fit, well, I don't want to be too negative. The one of the fixes and one thing that certainly found a place and is helping people, and we talk about mental illness pandemic, the next word is always um, telemedicine. Um, each of you quickly will go around the same order. How, just give me your, you know, your read on it. How, how valuable a tool is it, or is it sort of a rough instrument that we have to figure out how to use better? Kaber. Look, I think it could potentially be a very valuable tool. So as it happens, psychiatrists are the most comfortable among all specialists with using telemedicine. So there was a fairly low rate. We have seen in the last few months, a significant increase in the use of telemedicine by psychiatrists with their patients. Is it perfect in all situations for all ailments? Clearly not. But I think what's good is we've seen some of the necessary enabling infrastructure, including frankly around payment systems and so on, support the development of telemedicine. So is it the answer? Clearly not, but is it part of the answer? And having patients getting to a point of comfort about engaging virtually with a range of providers, it is definitely part of the answer. Matisse. I wholeheartedly agree. I think it is, it's part of the answer and I think it, it has the potential to be a very valuable tool. And I think one of the silver linings where we are with COVID is that it has um, really accelerated the momentum around telehealth by necessity. Um, and so, but we still have a lot more to do in the context of, you know, um, particularly in vulnerable populations, you know, they don't all have access to telemedicine, right? And so we still have work to do around access and really thinking through these highly vulnerable populations that are disproportionately affected um, by mental health issues. And in this case, it's, it's um, not just the, ur it's both urban and rural for the lack of technology uh, with the rural population. Um, has a lot of barriers to the telemedicine. Uh, JJ? Yeah, I, I agree with Lati. So telehealth or telemedicine for me is an, is an access enabler. It's one of the best things that we can exponentially reach more people. And it's an engagement platform. So I think that COVID has enabled us to at least adopt that much better than we ever have in the past. What we need to get better at is actually now using it potentially as a diagnostic or therapeutic tool and I think I know a lot of people are working hard at that, and that's the next stage. And Richard, your company um, makes one of the, I believe, three uh, drugs approved for uh, opioid uh, abuse disorder. Um, so t talk about more specifically um, people who were in opioid treatment. Um, there's an awful lot of difficult disruption there in, in this environment, the support services they were getting. Um, and that consistency they need. Um, that's a little bit your world. So bring in um, telemedicine into, into more of that. It's not the only thing you do, but it is part of what your company is known for. Well, Joanne, I think anyone who thinks that telemedicine is the solution to the mental illness uh, addiction problem in the country has not been exposed to how broken the treatment system actually is. Telemedicine is just simply a tool, but the, the quality of care is so poor and the lack of focusing on outcomes. I mean, often people say, well, 
what a triumph. We, we got a, an office visit via telemedicine versus an in-person visit. But no one asks, asks that question, well, how, how does it help the patient? These patients often have serious, chronic, debilitating diseases that are often progressive. The average length of therapy for a, a patient on a medicine is six months or so. Uh, the average continuity of care of somebody repeatedly seeing the, the physician that they, that they need to see on a consistent basis is abysmal. So we have to start uh, with a blank sheet of paper here and telemedicine will be a tool. In the, in the case of, of opioid dependence, it's so different than something like, like treating someone with cancer who might be actively seeking care. Often these patients have mixed motivations about even seeking the care that they need because they have an addictive disease. And so at the very moment when people might need that, 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 that handshake, that reach out, that connectivity to keep them in treatment, if you lose them then, you may not get them back. Uh, often with, with devastating consequences. So this is, this is a multifaceted problem and telemedicine, medicines in general are just one piece of it. It's a whole, it's a whole continuity of care structure that needs to be reconsidered in the country. You wanna look for, oh, I don't wanna, I don't wanna say there's a silver lining in a pandemic because obviously there's no silver lining in a, in a pandemic that's wreaking the kind of havoc it's wreaking. But, but if you're going to take something away, if you're going to find something that we can build on, particularly on this topic, in, in, how do we innovate? Are we, are we going to come out of this? Are you beginning to see opportunities or tools that will let you innovate faster, more efficiently, but still safely? I don't know who, which one of you wants to take that first. Otherwise, I'm just going to, JJ, start. Sure, that's that's a, a good question, Joanne. You know, we talked a little bit about this. As it, I think we all have the fortune of working within sort of global businesses and get to see the impact of how each country or region or culture, you know, approaches innovation. And I can speak personally. One of the major takeaways here is kind of the unification of focus. So where even in my personal life, I was. You know, had a trip coming up next week and I was focused on the elements of that trip to get to the next trip. I've eliminated all that noise and now we're like making huge strides within our company advancing the true indications that get to the patients most. Not that we weren't focused on that before, but it, there's just so much more clarity around some of the purpose of what we're doing. And we spoke a little bit about, you know, my colleagues in Japan and China and Israel and in Europe, we we just all connect a lot more, a lot more often, and our, our focus is a lot more unified. So this common purpose, you know, to, which we're not trying to overcome any one particular thing here other than just the, the entire experience that we're all dealing with is just forcing us to align by nature. So a bit of a broad answer, Joanne, but I'm still digesting. Uh, what we're, what it's a broad doing. question, right? Who else wants to take a crack at that? Okay. I think, you know, what we've, you know, if you take, you know, drug development, something somewhat narrow, whether therapeutics or vaccines, there are all sorts of barriers to doing things quickly. And, you know, many of us who worked in the industry are familiar with those barriers. I think what's hopeful is you've clearly seen a coming together, not any of different players, but regulators and others, to try and eliminate some of those barriers in the interest of speed, in the interest of getting to patients more quickly. Some of that, I hope and believe, will be sticky and sustaining, not all of it necessarily, because there are also going to be mistakes in this. You made the point that we've got to have safe treatments as well. So you can't short circuit everything. But I do think some of the, shall we say, regulatory and other inertia that's actually the devil of the system maybe has gone for good. At least I'm cautiously optimistic about that. Richard? As I mentioned, Joanne, in our prep call, innovation, medical scientific innovation is, is slow, as Kabir is saying. Policy changes can happen fast. And so use the crisis to affect policy changes. If, for example, coming out of, out of the crisis, there's a compelling need or desire to minimize the number of face-to-face -face interactions with caregivers to protect the patient and the, the caregiver. Well, then the use of long-acting injectable medicines that you can give once a month or once every two months or once every three months, minimizing those number of interactions so that in the telemedicine visit, the, the caregiver doesn't, doesn't have to worry about whether the patient is getting their medicines or not. That's sorted. Now you can focus on the, on the behavioral counseling, the other elements of the care that, that are so necessary. 
So I think that, that there will be some systematic changes that we should drive to, to make permanent as we, as we come out of it. I think not just, that won't just help replicate what we had pre-COVID, it should advance the quality of care post-COVID. Matisse, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I don't have comment a things more of a, you're the philanthropist, not yeah. the drug developer, but you, it's your world. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. No, I mean, I, I echo what everyone else has said. And I think that this is re a real opportunity, um, you know, to really to, to, to sort of reshift our focus a little bit. Because again, I think, you know, early in the year, there's a lot, there was a lot of noise, and then our world changed. And so, you know, there's a lot of opportunity to really rethink, you know, to, to Richard's point, you know, are there are there long lasting injectables? You know, how can we do this differently, especially in this patient population where um, treatment adherence is an issue? Um, how can we do this differently? My sister is, my sister is bipolar. And, you know, we go through these cycles where she's not taking her meds for a number of reasons. Um, but it's certainly difficult right now to get her meds and, you know, and to have her, her monitored and all those different things. So. I think, you know, we, we just, it, it, not to trivialize it, but we, it's an opportunity for us to be thoughtful and intentional and, and again, really take advantage of the, you know, limited amount of noise and, and sort of tunnel vision to figure out how do we do this better. There's been um, this astonishing and, and hopeful speed, right? I mean, we actually might get a vaccine you know, late this year, early next year, maybe, we still don't know. But it's the fact that it's even a maybe is in itself astonishing given how fast science usually progresses, right? Um, we ha probably have two treatments, no cure, but you know, again, it's only a few months and we're beginning, we're beginning to get some, you know, some tools that we pretty quickly that we couldn't have had if, you know, if we were looking through old compounds the way we used to without modern data, we wouldn't have, am I going to pronounce dexamethetrine right? Probably not, but it isn't any of your names, so it's okay. Um, but we've also had a few real mess ups, right? We've had two, at least two major retractions in journals, respected journals, you know, New England Journal, Lancet. We've had emergency authorizations given and then taken, and at least two that I can think of. Um, we have a public, and this is, this is broader than mental health, but we have a, a public that's skeptical of science. And that's not just in the United States, it's global. You know, skepticism of science, skepticism of expertise. Um, you know, is, you need trust to innovate. You also need trust for people to take your products and your breakthroughs. You need trust for people to prescribe them. You need, uh, underserved communities to feel like they were part of th that, that this is going to help them and that they were part of developing these drugs we've had we have not had we've had a lot of disparities or inequality in, in, in clinical trials so so is this sort of these this this speed but also errors you know what what makes you the three of you who had companies what what makes you worried about those two um, you know they're not contradictory they're parallel this great speed and then the risk of speed. I can, I'm happy to jump in. You know, I think right now by force majeure, we're reactionary. And, and uh, there's a spectrum of things that we deal with. So Richard alluded to, this is a slow process. It takes a lot of time, it's a lot of methodology. It's an iterative process for whether it's technology or, or therapy. And then there's the regulatory process, which has its own hurdles. and. And then there's the coverage and access, right? And, and that gets to the people that need it the most sometimes, which is the longest leap, tent, the pole, longest pole in the tent. And we're seeing reactions now about the three independently trying to catch up with each other. I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll learn from these reactions and we're already starting to do that even in the care paradigms of how we take care of the sickest patients. And that rather than be reactionary moving forward for major things like mental health or other, let's call them pandemics that may not be virally induced, that we'll have a little bit of a roadmap where all three can move in unison and provide a path forward uh, for larger scale solutions. So, you know, I think it's the nature of where we are right now and we're trying to figure out our, our feet one by one while we're running and hopefully just we're better off for it with all three uh, moving forward. I think there's also an additional layer of difficulty in mental illness because unfortunately, yeah, 
we have no cures for psychiatric disease and frankly, no prospects of cures for psychiatric disease. So I think, again, Richard mentioned earlier, you know, medication is just one very small part of the entire continuum of care, the patient journey for somebody living with serious mental illness. So I think it's an area where that level of trust or distrust in science causes us acute problems. But unfortunately, we're not going to come up with a silver bullet for schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or anything else anytime soon. It's going to be a wide array of potential interventions, some medical, some social, some with families and so on, that hopefully will enable us to get to better outcomes. You know, as, as we mentioned earlier, um, this pandemic has had um, a disproportionate impact and harm to you know, minority communities, which were already underserved. They have a higher uninsurance rate. They have a higher chronic disease burden. And although we don't usually think of mental, we don't always think of mental illness as a chronic disease, it, it is. For most, for you know, for many people, but the, probably most of them, um, and there's stigma in these communities. There's lack of, you know, we talked about telemedicine as a tool that reaches some but not all. Um, we don't even really know the impact, the full. We don't know the full impact on anybody because the data has been lousy. But we really don't know the full impact. On minority communities and that is also that's just not knowing it's also knowing how to address like we don't know where to put resources can maybe latisse and also talking about what the philanthropic world needs to do to not solve but ignite solutions um in these communities that are already underserved already feel left they don't feel left out they are left out um they're being hit by a disease, social upheaval, econo disproportionate economic damage, and they have less access to health care. So what, what's the fire you want to light? A, a contained burn. A <laughs> contained burn. Uh, there, I mean, there are quite a few to light, but you know, I mean, you know, to your point, particularly again in these these vulnerable communities, there there's mental health as a whole, there are stigma issues. Um, vulnerable committee co communities you know there are trust issues and so you know one of the things that that that's that weighs on my mind of, of how we can start to address this is you know and we're not i think we're not doing enough um is you know we know that there's a shortage of of mental health care workers right that's not a secret um but you know how can we be creative about deploying um, folks, how can we get po folks trained um, and deployed into these communities? And so, you know, we've seen this in 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 models. And actually, I'll take a step back. When I say deployed in these communities, not oh, you are a black person, you know, go into this community and talk, you know, because you relate culturally and or ethnically or whatever. It's more so finding people in these communities that live in these communities, um, understand this, the nuanced challenges in these communities, right? Because we're talking about both, you know, chronic me mental illness as well as acute, right? So environmental stressors and those sorts of things. So how do we think about training folks up? So they're not in school for 12 years, right? We don't have time for that. Um, how do we train folks up? that live in these certain communities and can build trust and build rapport and say, hey, these are the resources. Let me talk you through this, you know, if you need to get to a physician, this is, you know, this is how you do that. This is a list, et cetera. And we've seen this work in, in other indications like HIV. So, you know, there've been um, programs where they've deployed, they've taken specific, you know, community people in the community and trained them up on HIV um, and use them to deploy information, to deploy medicine, to deploy prophylactics. We've seen this in Baltimore specifically, um, and only because yeah, I live very close to Baltimore, um, where you know community like people are deployed into you know are, are trained to help people in their community, um, particularly heart patients, adhere to their meds, their diet, etc. So I think that there's you know there's a lot to be done, um, and I think that you know. It, philanthropy certainly is a, a great tool to catalyze um, programs like that, but it really, you know, all of these solutions, it, it's not just philanthropy, it's not just industry, it's not just 
it's it's all of us right it, it we're we're past the point of oh that's industry's got that or you, philanthropy's got that we're beyond that we were beyond that pre pre-pandemic um and so really you know trying to blow out the message in the largest bullhorn that i can that we have to collaborate um, it can't be a one-dimensional solution, but that, you know, in terms of these vulnerable communities, that, that's, that's my key priority. And I think the other thing that I'll say, and just on, sort of going back to the policy issue, you know, we need to expand capacity. We need to expand the system and not just create space for more people to come in to, to get treatment and help, um, but we need to address the policies that envelop the system, right? You know, to the point, policy can change fast. If we all focus and stop fighting with one another about things that don't matter, we can actually you move. Mean, like masks? Like if we just decided? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But there's so Depoliticize much. Depoliticize them and just put them on, right? <laughs> right. Just put it on. But there's so much to do whether you are, you know, whether you are, again, in a vulnerable population, low income, have means, don't have means. I'll tell you a very quick story using myself as an example. You know, I'm, I'm in terms of life, I'm pretty good, right? Like I, I, I'm, I got a good job. I have health insurance, you know, slight disadvantage because of the color of my skin, but other than I'm pretty okay. Um, I lost my best friend in my, who was my mom back in August. And we've been preparing for her to leave the planet for a decade. We're both super rational people to the point where it's almost um, disturbing sometimes. Um, so well before she was sick, we planned for this. And, and a few months before, again, when she was still A-OK, -okay, I thought to myself, huh, I should probably get into therapy. Just, you know, she's aging. She's coughing a little bit. Like, let me just um, get back into that process because I know that it takes 60 days to link up with a therapist for 60 days. So I started that process early and I'm thankful that I did because after my first visit, my mom was sick. She was diagnosed with uh, pancreatic cancer. And as I'm going through that process of being a caregiver and having to make decisions about hospice and moving her out of my home and all these different things, it's a lot. But I had to wait 30 days to see her again. So my point there is that I have pretty good access to health care. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm okay. Um, but even at that, I still couldn't get what I needed in, a, in, in terms of access in a timely manner. You know, when she finally passed away and, you know, and I was left in the stillness of my grief, which we all know can sneak up on you, wash over you in an instant. Um, you know, I had a day where I was like, I need someone right now. And I had to make six phone calls to get to someone to talk me through what was happening that day. So point there is we have a lot of work to do in terms of access all across the board, not just the vulnerable populations. Well, I'm sorry about your loss. And um, it's also hard to be going through that in a pandemic where you don't have, I mean, hugs are, like, I don't know if that should be a DSM, like hug deprivation. <laughs> you should be able to bill for that. Mm -hmm. um, right? um, I sort of want to let that sit there for a minute. And um, we've all experienced loss. And for the people watching this, um, you know, this is, you know, it, it gets back to what I was starting with, which is there were, there's sort of three categories. We know there were people who already had unmet needs or they had met needs probably after a struggle that have been disrupted by the pandemic. We know there are people who are developing problems because of the isolation, stress, uh, multiple sources of stress, um, you know, tendencies they may have been able to cope with, but we're living in an uncopable, you know, we all sort of are putting our one foot in front of the other, but none of, I mean, how can we really be coping? And that's the question is what is the un, what are we facing next? I mean, how, how, pent, how, how do we have any idea? And are our policymakers talking about, you know, when we begin to come out of this and we begin to try to, I mean, all of you have had, you're, you're all very successful people and you're all copers and you all must have had moments when you started thinking about what's really going on and it's really too big to think about or to absorb. And you just sort of said, oh, I'll think about it tomorrow. I'm going to go back to work. Um, you know, am I, do you agree that there's people who are going to, like, there's going to be a whole nother wave of, of people who coped up to a point and then 
possibly as we emerge from it or later into the pandemic, we're going to have yet another, um, yeah, I don't know what you want to call it, you know, another manifestation of behavioral illnesses, stresses, people who need help, whether it's something you prescribe or a device you invent, which I'm going to come back to in a second. Um, you know, is, the, is there a third, you know, we keep it to the first and the second wave of the pandemic, is there another wave of a behavioral component that's going to, a tidal wave, really? I mean, am I, am I worrying more than I should be, or am I not worrying enough? I was on a call with one of the major insurers the other day who had done, they had done a 14,000 person survey and found that 40% of people working from home in this type of format were drinking at home. So establishment sales of alcohol have gone down in bars and restaurants and they're skyrocketing for home consumption. That is a story, Joanne, that's gonna end poorly. So you couple that with, with economic uncertainty, fear and loss uh, with copious amounts of alcohol over a sustained period of time. That, that has the beginnings of another wave. So anyone else wanna to add to that? Yeah. I always- The beer go ahead, please. I, I was just going to agree. I mean, I think, unfortunately, you know, we have, first, I'm not sure what a post-pandemic world actually really looks like or exists. I think it's a world in which we have to live with this pandemic at some level, because the idea that a vaccine is going to be 100% effective or universally effective or universally taken seems or universally available. So, you know, it's a, it's a world where the pandemic is part of it, and I don't think any of us know the shape of that. But again, Richard's points, you know, it's, it's not just on the alcohol side and other addictions. You know, we also know that PTSD manifests for a long period after the significant impacts of trauma and to the point we've already talked about, people who've suffered a particular loss, you know, whether that's a loss of a family, a divorce, whatever it may be in this period, I suspect the coping with that is actually going to be delayed. AJ, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, on, the, on the other end of the spectrum a little bit, you know, I have four young children and uh, virtual schooling, the shift to screen time, the, the isolation from social encounters, you know, these are, these are young, eight, six, four, and two, uh, that you could notice a difference. And, you know, I think that we poured a lot of our time and resources to make sure it was as seamless as possible for them which was exhausting for us as parents. But uh, you know, they, you would see the way they'd react to things and they were different and their personalities changed after a consumption of screen time, not being able to get their energy out with friends and or you know, just community learning. And uh, we're not sure how that's going to end up. We don't even know what the next school year is going to bring. So to make sure that that healthy maturation of our, you know, of our, our little precious beings uh, continues in the way that we had it and knew how to do it. I, I, we don't really know how to, how to anticipate that. And I think there will be behavioral and mental health issues that arise from that age population. And certainly those people going through high school and these material years of growth and early college that is so severely impacted. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to talk, go back to a little bit, um, three of you are businessmen. Um, in the mental health world, or partly in the mental health world. Um, and the FDA is being extremely flexible on COVID, using emergency use authorizations, um, occasionally withdrawing them, um, but generally breaking down barriers and making things happen fast. Not flawlessly, but that's, that's where they're going. Um, you know, sometimes they may, you know, move this way, then that way, and it's not perfect. Is there room for you? Is so much energy going toward COVID? I mean, we've all heard about clinical trials being disrupted and so forth, but in your, in the product, in the mental health products or devices or techniques that you have in the pipeline, are you on hold at a time when you're really needed? Because capacity is limited at the FDA, because do they have a single lens? or alternatively, the, this is a long-winded question, I will, end, I will end it now, is something they're doing in COVID you already know that's gonna be available to you and you'll be able to, to take that speed up um, with, within safety parameters that you feel comfortable with and that your, your market has to feel comfortable with, not just you. Um, you wanna start, JJ? Because you're, you're doing the stuff that 
the listeners know the least about. So explain it a little bit. Sure. Yeah, I guess 10,000 foot view, you know, we have the fortune of working with a lot of really great physicians to deliver energy in the uh, in sort of the platform of sound waves uh, through the through the skull into the brain uh, to treat everything from movement disorders all the way to neuro oncology, and we work across the spectrum of neurological disorders, many of which come with components of mental health uh, as either a direct or an indirect cause of, of a long stage disease process. And I'll just speak to your direct question. So we are considered an elective procedure, right? We are a procedure that's done typically in a hospital outpatient setting, um, both for research and for commercial applications. And that was frozen, right? And I think like many other businesses, we had to take time internally to just make sure that our people and our business knew what was going on and we had to adapt and adjust. And that's fine. I think everybody had to do that. But what I will compliment is the absolute resiliency of the physicians and clinicians and teams that we work with who were there for their patients with non-COVID related issues that didn't go away and increased in severity um, and, and had them ready to go. We're continuing telehealth engagement. And then within a matter of about four to six weeks started bringing them back in in a really smart, intelligent way. And we adapted a full technical platform to enable the support that otherwise was usually in person. Uh, and, it, and we made it work. And, and I just, I, I give all the compliments and kudos to the, the frontline providers who had to shift gears. We had neurosurgeons taking care uh, you know, in the ICU of, of parameters for intubation, and that's not their normal job. I'm an anesthesiologist by training. I know a neurosurgeon doesn't normally handle intubation parameters, but they did, and they stepped up, which was awesome, and they got right back to helping their patients as well, you know, losing sleep, but more than happy to do it. So maybe we paused, but we didn't stop, and now we're more invigorated and, and working at full capacity and beyond what we thought certainly we would be at, at this point uh, within the pandemic. Richard, you, uh, you want to jump in on FDA? Yeah, I would say that, that FDA is not the issue. FDA, FDA, this is, this is a, a, an incredible contrast between the urgency associated with COVID and the complacency associated with serious mental illness. And it goes back to this question of access. Even if you develop, if you're successful over a multi-year program of developing a new psychiatric medication, you bring that to payers and they say, look, we have a bunch of generic drugs. They're cheap. They work just fine. Thank you very much. Contrast that in oncology where new medicines with new evidence, they help patients are rapidly adopted, reimbursed, and the, and the field progresses. It's, it's abysmal, the state of the, of the evolution of the pharmacology of, of, of important psychiatric diseases uh, over the last 20 years. I mean, just small incremental improvements because it's just very difficult to get any new innovations adopted and paid for in the real world because these patients are stigmatized. So the, pay, the stigmatization that um, individuals and families endure has actually been baked into our reimbursement system. You know, it's there, a, it's are, a, there are over a thousand new medicines in development for the treatment of cancer. I would be Many surprised. of which cost a lot of money. I mean, they save lives, but they're not cheap. Those are not unrelated. The, re the reason why so many cancer drugs are being developed is because they can charge, you can charge a lot of money and they get reimbursed. Conversely, if you develop a new drug for schizophrenia, it's going to cost $1,000 a month circa, well, you know, just to put a round number on it, compared to a cancer drug, which is going to cost $20,000 a month. And the payer for that $1,000 drug is not a commercial insurer. It's likely to be the government. And uh, it's going to be Medicaid or dual eligibles under Medicare. And these are systems that are strapped financially. Patients do not get access to branded medications. You're forced to fail on multiple generics. If you imagine having breast cancer, going to an oncologist and saying, well, you need to fail on three or four generic breast cancer drugs before we put you on a branded medication. That's the, that's the condition that exists in serious mental illness and addiction in the country. And I just, I'll just add, I mean, and, and, you know, it's, it's so important because a couple of years ago, we did a, a mental health survey, um, super simple, but it turns out no one had actually taken the time to ask patients with lived experience, how would they prioritize research if they were squarely in the driver's seat? And, you know, when we, when we asked that question, we got a, a plethora of responses because we also talked about onset and symptoms and, in and, and all sorts of things, but the key thing that resonates is, you know, people 
people with lived experience want to improve the quality of life. They want to feel, and I'm using quotes because I'm quoting what was in what we, you know, their words, they want to feel normal. Now, I, you, we can dispute what is normal, right? But they want to be on the road consistently to being well. And with, you know, medicate with drug therapy, oftentimes they're battling these terrible side effects that range from it physically, it makes me feel physically ill, or it makes me feel like someone who is not me. And so, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking to, to understand, you know, what we all have a clear understanding of, which is, yes, this is baked into our reimbursement system. The stigma is baked in, and there are clear barriers for not good reasons, right? Like we could really help these people. We can improve their quality of life. We can pr improve their productivity. They can hold down jobs longer. We can reduce absenteeism, all these different things, but it's not, it's not a value. And it's, it's, it's crazy. And, you know, I, as, a, as a scientist, you know, who's worked across a lot of different indications, I 100%, I support, you know, um, drug development around cancer. But the reality is quite a few cancer drugs, especially the ones that, you know, you have to pretty much take out another mortgage on your house for, they don't lead to you surviving. You might be able to survive an extra couple months and no one can put a value on that except the person who is trying to survive to walk their daughter down the aisle or see their kid graduate or whatever. But the reality is, the economic reality is, that is it worth mortgaging your house to pay for these treatments? And why is that in direct competition with mental health drug development in the context of payers and reimbursement? Why can't we even this system out? Clear, you wanted to. Well, I just wanted to jump in and say, I mean, I, I completely agree that the, the economic incentives are not there. And by the way, if you think it's tough in this country, try launching a novel antipsychotic in Europe. I mean, there it's, it's truly impossible. But I want to take one hopeful thing as well, because I do think, you know, part of the problem also is, you know, particularly in psychiatry, this is really hard. I mean, these are really hard diseases to treat. And to Richard's point, unfortunately, not many folks are left standing in the industry who are still committed for this area. But there are some of us, his company, my company, other companies as well. And I think the hopeful piece is we are finally starting to see potentially some novel mechanisms, some that actually go down different chemical routes and so on that may come forward. You know, we've seen ketamine approved for treatment resistant depression. There is research going on in other mechanisms. So you know, I think we have to take that positive and that focus on innovation as well. But I completely agree that we're in a land of completely skewed incentives um, you know, across the piece in terms of what gets paid for, in terms of even you know, non-medical treatments, talk treatments, therapies. I mean, Latisse was talking about that earlier, the access to therapies, getting therapy repaid for. There's, there's lots of non-medical interventions as well that have been proven to work, which are equally stigmatized. I'm going to do audience questions because there are a number. Some of them have, we've already raised and then I'm going to come back to you um, and one of the we're going to end with two questions that I'm going to ask you at the end and one of them is going to be um, all of you have workforces and all of you have workforces who are experiencing all these difficult things that we are talking about and I would like all of you because I think there's also leaders in our audience who are trying to also figure out how to take care of the people who work for them so I'm going to ask you how are you caring and tending to or trying to um, attend to the mental health needs and stresses of your worker forces and if we have time i'll have one more question but i think that's an important one i mean i have a little staff compared to you guys but i'm i'm always trying to you know i mean being extremely maternal i suppose helps but um you know what what could i do what what am i not picking up on on zoom that i would notice in the office let alone all the extra stuff from how we're living now. But let me, let me go to audience questions and see if I can manage two screens at home without disconnecting anybody. Um, what kind of policies would foster, we've touched on this a little bit, and I, let me start with Latisse on this. What type of policies are really gonna genuinely foster public-private co cooperation on mental health? What, what, do you, what do you wanna wake up and 
<laughs> find out, hey, this happened when I slept overnight. <laughs> Um, I mean, there's, you know, this is, this is a, it's a combinatorial problem and, and there's no shortage, I think, of, of solutions, you know, but I think, I think what it would, not to be overly reductionist, but what it boils down to is incentives, right? And so, you know, really taking a look and it's not, it's not just one policy, it's collectively looking at our policy and saying, okay, where are we misaligned in, in incentives? And yes, the bottom line is always going to be important. Right. We live in a capitalistic society. That is what it is. But there are ways that we can meet in the middle. And so, you know, really taking a look at what these incentives are um, and, you know, and, and, and really trying to loosen, um, I guess, you know, or, or I guess holding payers more accountable, right, to be more balanced. You know, the, 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 the payer system in some ways is, there are lots of different, if you think about it as a house, there are lots of different rooms to the payer system. And some of them are just complete black boxes. Um, and why and some of them that? just got locked up. More people got locked out of when they lost their jobs, right? That too. Millions, yeah. That yeah. too. And so why is that? So, you know, we, I think taking a holistic approach and not necessarily just focus on one policy, but like laying it out and saying, all right, what, you know, let's prioritize these. Let's see what we can adjust. Which rooms are the black box? Go get the key to unlock them, get the light, you know? Um, but there's, there's, that's a loaded question. Do any of you on the um, private sector side wanna, what do you need from the nonprofit world to, to maximize what you're doing? Philanthropic or nonprofit? You know, what I, I would say, Joanne, is that every year we've been convening patient advocacy groups, disease advocacy groups at our company for a summit just to talk about the state of, of, of the deplorable condition of, of serious mental illness and addiction. And my, my fervent request or admonishment each year is I contrast the activism, the advocacy of, of, of cancer societies or rare disease societies I mean, they're, they're awesome the way they can drive policy changes, they can drive FDA changes, yet the serious mental illness community, the addiction community is not nearly as organized and as, as politically potent as these other organizations are. So I wish if given the pervasiveness of the condition across all of our families, everybody has a connection at some level, if we could marshal this as a political uh, advocacy force, it would be awesome. And it's amazing how disaggregated it, it is. You know, one of our reporters did a terrific six month um, project on a huge mental illness issue that we don't even talk about in America anymore, which is fetal alcohol. And uh, they're like, she kept trying to find the advocacy people to find out why they weren't more effective and she could barely find any advocacy people. It's such a forgotten it's a, a tangent, but boy, is that, I mean, I can see that being a problem six months or nine months from now, <laughs> or I mean, nine months from January, because there's probably gonna be some babies and as one of you mentioned, you know, alcohol consumption at home is, is very high. And, and um, I think it's really easy for people to uh, rationalize that. And, um, you know, not everybody who drinks alcohol obviously is abusing alcohol, but um, I, I think that we could have a follow-up conversation next year about that topic. Um, Richard, uh, Kabir, did you want to mention at that as well? No. Um, this is a good question here because we've talked about the FDA and we've talked about collaboration, but this is really a question about what, can, what more can the NIH do? Um, NIH, pharma, academia, how can they foster open science and a collaborative community to break the silos that do not share data, that create silos and that fail to replicate the science? We are seeing some more collaboration. We're certainly seeing coll collaboration on the vaccine world. We're seeing that some collaboration on COVID treatment. We're see, we have seen increased collaboration in the last couple of years on cancer and in some pockets of that world. What about your world? Can NIH fix it? I don't, nobody has tried to fax us in 20 years. And today, of course, I'm gonna mute one. <laughs> um, Joanne, I can, I can jump in. You started um, the topic of conversation on opioid use disorder. And you know, one of the things that I've seen is a very salient is small wins lead to big change. And so, you know, using opioid addiction or opioid use disorder as a case example, uh, you know, I've seen that in West Virginia, uh, which is kind of one of the epicenters of this abuse problem, 
there's a great collaborative effort going on between the NIH, between the FDA, between technology, including ourselves, and between caregivers with this holistic approach. And I'm gonna just add to what Richard was saying is, this is complex care. If you take a cancer patient and you talk about pre-treatment, surgery, radiation, chemotherapy or immunotherapies, the full extent, that there is an analogous process for an, the accurate and appropriate approach to mental health disorders related to opioid addiction. And it's an inpatient setting. It includes psychotherapy, it includes group therapy, it includes you know, physical energy delivery, it includes you know, intensive follow-up. And there's not a whole lot of access for the range of population that needs that. But I would say that there is a huge collaboration there of trying to get it right and figuring out what that looks like and then taking the next step of how do we scale this. But I, I'm optimistic. I will say that you know, if we can focus on case examples, make successes, even if they're small, we can start to create a fire that gets bigger. Um, so optimism is where I'm standing on, on NIH, at least in their participation with that in academia. Richard, do you have anything on that topic? I think that the principal agencies that, that we would be concerned about are NIDA, which is National Institute of Drug Abuse, and, and NIMH, which is Institutes of Mental Health. Uh, I think neither of them are, are, are central fixtures. I'm curious what Kabir says. They're really not central players in the, in the new drug development innovation world. And that, I think that's a missed opportunity. Um, but, uh, and it goes back to this issue of policy changes, because often a lot of the, the, the novel scientific approaches, new protocols, new, new uh, models for delivery of care can originate in those settings because they're nonpartisan. It's very difficult for companies to, to drive a new treatment paradigm because it's almost inherently self-serving. And so I think, I think if there were more of a focus on outcomes for patients, Tom Insel used to run the National Institutes of Mental Health. And he said one time that the, the mental health treatment system is designed for the care and comfort of the physicians, not the patients. And I think that you can really see that. That's why change is so slow to come. And I think the government could be a much, much more powerful advocate for, for driving change. Kabir, okay. do you want to comment? No, I, I agree with Richard. I think a couple of elements. I think first, we also need to acknowledge that brain science is far from settled. There are lots of controversies. There's lots of debate about the right approaches and so on. But secondly, also, as we know, mental illness is not just a chemical issue. I mean, it's clearly a social, environmental. It's an incredibly complex issue. And that's why we've kept on using the word collaboration. We've talked about it and so on. So not only I agree with Richard that actually you know, putting NIH, NIDA firmly at the center of some of these advances would be great, but also we have to put together those broad collaborations of different capabilities because we have to drive to better outcomes for these patients, and that's not just going to be around the medication. The, um, just the fact that those, the names of those two institutes really reflect outdated attitudes, right? Drug abuse yeah. is separate from mental illness. So if you were to start it all over again, uh, I'm, I, maybe it would all be, you know, one institute of, you know, behavioral, whatever the current best word, behavioral disorder, behavioral and, you know, behavioral illness, mental and behavioral, you, whatever acronym you needed, but you know, that those two are actually, and I know Nora Volko and she's great, but just, the, just think about the name, right? Yeah. <laughs> one is an illness and one is abuse. And addiction yes, and really add, exists just by itself without other contributing mental health issues. Right, right, right. So oh, can okay. I add so, my, my dream very quickly? Um, so Until they turn us off, yeah. <laughs> yeah, until they turn us off. You know, I, I think we see, you know, we have a lot of misalignment in our leadership, in our government. And, you know, a lot of people find, um, in some ways, find comfort in, in Tony Fauci, you know, and, and, and really search for direction when it comes to the pandemic. My dream would be, you know, particularly during this time to ride that momentum and have the leaders of, of those two organizations out front and talking about having the conversation that we're talking about, but with the public to say, hey, there's another current of crisis happening and we're all a part of it. And it's okay that you feel mentally stretched it's okay, but there's help out here for you. Now, granted, we are talking about, we've sat here and talked about parts of the system that are broken and lack of in, you know, inadequate access, et cetera. So again, that's why I say it's my dream um, 
But I think, you know, how can NIH do more, do better? You know, use those resources. Like, it's don't just be a funding agency. Use the leadership in, in, in creative ways. Tony Fauci has been an amazing um, advocate for HIV and, 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 and gotten us through this pandemic and, and other things that have been on the horizon that we don't even know about. Um, and so, you know, at a time where leadership is challenging, it, you know, at the very top of our, of our government system, how can the NIH step in and, and, and you know, again, sort of stoke this, this conversation? So that would be my dream. So we just have a couple of minutes left, and I, there, there are a lot of really good questions, some of which we got to. Um, but I, I also want to point out, we're not going to discuss it now, but just, you know, one of the questions pointed out that the lack of a, there just aren't a lot of Black psychiatrists, psychologists, or therapists, so that is just something people should take with them. Quickly, because we're, we're almost out of time, each of you, one thing you were doing, um, and I know your company, uh, Kave, has, is sort of ahead of the curve on some of what you're doing um, to take care of the mental health of the people who are working for you um, in, at this particular time. We'll just go quickly and then we'll wrap. So just, just to say, first, it's the number one priority. So right from the start, but the safety, well-being, both physical and mental of our staff has been the number one priority ahead of anything else and their families and so on. And I think it's, you know, we have put a number of tools in place, a number of programs in place and so on, which is all good. But the fundamental is for every leader from me down in the organization to recognize that, to acknowledge just how challenging and stressful this circumstance is, and to create space wherever we can for people to get on with their lives given all the complexities and so on. Have we got it perfectly right? Of course not. Of course there have been challenges, there have been issues, but I think you know, right from the start, we really had to make clear that that was our number one priority in getting through this pandemic. Matisse? Time and flexibility, you know, really um, encouraging people to take time um, and, and giving them flexibility to do that. And so, you know, the new reality is not what we expected, it, you know, December of last year. And so, and there's a lot of processing time that goes with everything happening. And so time and flexibility, encouraging people to take time off, um, you know, take vacations, even though, yeah, we're quarantined, but still take that time. Um, and also, you know, giving them tools, encouraging them to use tools like our employee assistance program, which has counseling services, um, you know, tools big and small. We've, we've given everyone a subscription to the Calm app, which helps me uh, on a daily basis. Um, but the main things are flexibility and time. Richard? One thing I remind all our folks, which is really inspiring, is that this effect, this pandemic is affecting the entire world, but very few of us have the opportunity to work professionally in a way to do something about it and to help. So having having, having a purpose for working is, is really nice because a lot of people have lost that purpose in their professional world. The second thing is is just human interaction. We we never had a culture of having these types of video calls. We always were, we would just get on conference calls, but now we all get on it's amazing how we use the video because just seeing each other makes a huge difference and you can pick up you can pick up certain things that you that you can't just on a on a voice call and then the third point to to echo what Leticia is flexibility and we have we have single parents with with two kids trying to homeschool and they just can't be on every call every time you need them to be on a call and but they, there's plenty of hours in the day where they can, so you just have to let people flow and, and figure out a way to, to get this stuff done without making judgments or bringing your own sensibilities to it. It's sort of nice to have Zoom calls with three-year-olds on people's laps, yeah. <laughs> JJ. Yeah, thanks, Joanne. I, I echo everything everyone says, and I think we're just unapologetically behind the mental and physical health of our people. Um, and we've seen it's been challenging to some external situations, but we think any near-term missed business opportunity is not consequential at this point, that we're in it for the long-term and our people are gonna get us there. So I think the most important thing is that every decision we've made as an executive team has just validated that. Getting feedback constantly from them to make sure we're doing the right things. And what I tell my staff is I say, you know, you would have never taken a bedroll and slept under your desk in the Politico newsroom. So just remember, it's more or less what you're doing now and take a break. So this has been a really, really interesting conversation. I hope that other people found it as interesting as I did. You're all 
really thoughtful people. Thank you for Milken for facilitating this and thank you for joining us today. And I think someone will now tell me how to turn this off and we'll <laughs> see you again at a future event. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, Joanne.